Okay, whoops. So just once again, let's just be clear. Processed foods are not mm. necessarily bad for you because cooking is a process. Fermentation is a process. So we eat processed foods. Most of our foods we eat are processed in some way. Ultra processed foods is processing of foods that we can't, is industrial processing of foods that we can't do in our kitchen or, or most restaurants. So it's the stuff that are pretty much most of the pre-packaged stuff that we buy is going to be ultra processed because it's industrially processed. Now the, and I'm not an ultra processed food Nazi, okay? I'm just, I'm not. Let me tell you what the problem with ultra processed, most ultra processed foods are. That because they're ultra processed, prime, they are stripped of protein and or fiber, depending on what we're talking about. It's just the way it is. Okay, the mm -hmm. processing just removes protein and removes fiber. And it also removes flavor. So as a result, you have to add back in flavor, which comes from the holy trinity of sugar, salt, and fat. So ultra processed foods tend to be lower in protein and fiber and therefore calorically very available, which means that our body uses very little energy to get the calories from ultra processed foods compared to a steak, compared to celery, and typically higher in salt, sugar, and fat. And that is the reason why ultra processed foods, and we eat too much of it. In, in this yeah. country, UK, we get more than 50% of our calories from, of our energy from ultra processed foods. So yeah. it does make a big difference um, when we're talking about ultra processed um, foods, but primarily protein and fiber. That's yeah. lack thereof. Doctor's Kitchen, recipes, health, lifestyle. Mate, love the book. I've, oh, uh, I've been reading it uh, and going through everything. Um, and my first question actually was going to be about um, whether you're, whether you're bored in the nicest way possible, whether you ever get bored of being asked about calories all the time. Do you ever find yourself like, ah, oh, can't we just like move on to something else or something, you know, a lot, a lot wider or do, do you know what I mean? Do I, I mean, I, I hope we all get bored with it soon to be fair. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I don't because I think there is so, we do worship the calorie, don't we? And I, I think as society, and this is the, the, the thing that's weird. So because so because there's so many um, things wrong, well, not wrong with it, because as long as you use it correctly, but so many misunderstandings about it, I relish the opportunity, and it's a terrible thing to say, uh, um, in, in, in order to correct some of the misconceptions. I will be bored at some point, not yet. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. Because, like, I mean, I get asked about it uh, quite a bit. And, mm. well, I mean, I, I get asked the same questions over and over again, which for 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 a lot of people is the first time they've heard someone talk about it in, you know, a way that makes sense to them, in a way that's, like, easy and it's not, you know, restrictive, rigid, and, and whatever. Um, but for me, it's like, I just wish there was a way, like a platform where everyone could just, like, be educated on it and everyone have the, the like similar opinions such that there's not this miscommunication and i think that's what the book does so very well because you're going through different diets you go through the pros and cons there's a ton of humor into that um but before we go into the book i want to mm. talk a bit about you and wh wh where you where you grew up because i learned a few things and i'm, I'm going to tell you a few things about about me as well and i think we're going to have uh, uh, some shit a, a bit of a bonding experience at the start here yo <clears throat> my brother from another mother yeah let's do this <laughs> <laughs> so tell me where, where where did you grow up so i this, this is a complicated story to, to to some degree so my i popped out actually so to speak and um in, in in london because my dad is a um my dad is a medic well retired medic but he was um thinking around he did his registrar training um in endocrinology at uh, king's college london uh, in in the early 70s which is when i was born and that's why so so you know, my mom was, and I, so that's where I came out. But then we then moved back. So I, then he went up to Newcastle. So I spent um, five years in Newcastle. And so there's this small Chinese boy from Singapore, uh, now with a full, full on Geordie accent, because I learned yeah, how to, yeah. sp to speak. And then we moved back to Singapore. So I was then in Singapore for a few years um, until I pinged around the world for a bit. I pinged to Boston, back to Singapore. And then we finally emigrated to um, San Francisco, which is ah. where I did high school. And I did my um, university. Um, and it was then after that, then I came to Cambridge to do my PhD and stayed here. So that broadly speaking. So in terms of bringing up, my culture is probably um, Singaporean Chinese uh, for my early life. And then suddenly this huge cultural change into going to California, to San Francisco. And then from high school and university, which is a very 
a, a formative moment a, a part of your life obviously yeah that that was american so it was chinese singaporean first and probably where a lot of my food culture was embedded okay mm. and then my culture culture the, the, the way i think uh, um and stuff was probably done in california so that broadly speaking is me that's that's fascinating um i mean like when you read the book it, like your humor comes across very british if i'm honest like it's it, it, it comes through in every single page and you know the memes that you talk about and stuff but the the stuff about um you growing up in san francisco was super interesting because mm. you said at the start you're a big nfl fan is that still the case i am really 49 so 49ers, 49ers go woo <laughs> They're not doing very well this year. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. So I'm going to tell you something. So I'm a massive uh, NFL fan. Mm. Um, yeah, Are you? So I, yeah. So I got into it when I was at school. One of my best friends uh, who now lives in Chicago. Uh, it was his dream to always like move to America. And he ended up doing that in his 20s. Um, he got me into NFL in a big way. He was a big Minnesota Vikings fan. Okay. And I went to Harvard um, just to go visit the campus with my parents. So we did this whole trip. We went to like Cape Cod and uh, some other parts in Boston and stuff. And I picked up a shirt and it was a 24 Ty Law. He was the the cornerback for the Patriots Mm -hmm. in the year that they won that. So I I picked up the shirt in that year. Uh, the whole issue with Bloodsoe and Tom Brady. Uh, Tom Brady came in the fourth uh, uh, pick, you know, uh, yeah. from the draft. People who people have no idea about NFL are like completely confused right now. But anyway, he was like, you know, the bottom of the rank. He came in, won the Super Bowl, became, you know, the poster child for NFL across the world, uh, like the the Michael Jordan of the NFL world, yeah. essentially. The goat, um, as they call the it. The goat, yes. exactly. Yes. The goat uh, of uh, American football. Uh, and I've been hooked on on uh, the Patriots every t- ever since. But interesting thing, I got really into it when I was at medical school. Mm. Um, and John Taddy, that we were talking about earlier, he will he will attest to this. I would go to the sports cafe every Sunday to watch the games on my own because no one else would go with me because no one else oh, was football. Yeah, I was there on my own. And I played fantasy football and I won the Sky Sports Fantasy Football League in the UK in 2024 uh, uh, 2004 so, so what? i got yeah so i got tickets to go to the super bowl when the patriots played uh the yeah the eagles in ja- i know i don't for Rupi, those who are listening I, like, listen listen we're here to talk about calories but no let's let move let's go let's uh, change subjects now this is what <laughs> yeah yeah so this i mean no one no one knows this i've been spoken about this for for years and no one would be able to appreciate this is like essentially being given tickets to go to the world cup uh, yes. watching your favorite team like whether that be brazil or I something mean, tickets you know, cost in brazil ridiculous sums of money like you know yeah. all the fancy people go you know and 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 rupee and it's like like 15 <laughs> grand or something or 10 grand for tickets and you see beyonce at halftime and it's just a crazy event yeah, Dude. it was a crazy, crazy event. Um, and, you know, so I won the, the thing in Sky Sports. So I played every single week. And mm. uh, I, I remember, like, the, the, the league table was announced live on Sky Sports. And I remember, like, watching it with my baby sister and my dad. My dad had no idea what was going on, jumping up and down. And, uh, yeah, no, the Sky Sports team sent me out there. They gave me, um, like, accommodation. We went to the tailgate party. It was, like, the best time of my life, that, like, honestly. And I was, like, second year of medical school or something like that. So, like, you know, it was, uh, it was brilliant. It was so fun. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate I'm speechless. that story. I, I, I'm speechless. We, we, we can end the, end the conversation now. See you later. Thanks we're for having now. me. Yeah, see you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Okay, NFL aside, um, yes. let's uh, <laughs> uh, let's talk uh, about the book because uh, the the book has got quite a provocative title, right? And it does. I know right at the start of the book, you 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 tell people to hold their horses uh, and not at you. But despite that health warning, I reckon you've been atted by a number of people uh, since this book coming out, right? So 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 why don't we get to the crux of of the book? I know it's got a provocative title, but like, what 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 would you say? is the overarching theme of why calories don't count. Oh, I think there is, if, if I only had one sentence to say, it's very, very simple. We eat food and we don't eat calories. And I think that's the absolute critical basis of it. People think about calories. The calories are the units of energy that once you extract it, and, and they are equal once they're in you as a little poof of energy, all right? But that's not what we eat. We eat 
food and we can eat good food, bad food, healthy food, whatever it is. And then our body then works to, to, to take apart the food, digest and extract the calories. Mm. And so we need to concentrate on the food rather than the calories because the calories are just an output of the food. Um, and so what we eat influences how many calories we actually get, uh, get out of the food. That, in essence, is why calories don't actually count. They count. Just let me just before we count. Clearly, 200 calories of chips is twice the portion of 100 calories of chips. Mm -hmm. But so is 200 grams of chips, twice the portion of 100 grams of chips. And no one is trying to compare 200 grams of chips to 200 grams of carrots. So mm. it's not quite that extreme, but the analogy is there. That's why calories, I think, don't count. Okay, fine. Um, so we'll, we'll get to the nuance of the, the calories and how they might be um, differently absorbed and, and differently utilized depending on the person consuming them. But let's go down, seeing as you love talking about calories, as we've established at the start, and you're not bored <laughs> of it yet. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's go down memory. I want to, I want to qualify it because I don't want to ask you the same kind of questions and you're like, oh, okay, fine. But, um, let's, uh, let, let's, let's go into the history of, of calories mm. and, and where it came from. Cause you do a beautiful job of going through, you know, how this came about, the the progression of the science since um, the, the well, pre-French Revolution, I think it was, um, with Antoine, Lav I'm probably going to butcher this name, but Antoine Lavoisier. Um, and, beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful. I know, I wish I could speak French, actually. It's just like a lovely, it's such a mellifluous sounding uh, uh, language. But anyway, uh, Antoine Lavoisier um, and, and, and how, we, how we got here to this point. So... <laughs> I mean, it's very, it, it is old. It is very, very old. And it's when people were trying to, to understand almost transfer of matter from one to the other, you know, but what happens when you burn wood? Where does the mm. wood disappear to? How come it, it, it disappears? And this was the, the concept that, that Lavoisier was actually, was actually thinking about. And, and so he began to realize that when you actually transfer that matter doesn't disappear. He, he in effect, was, was uh, the first person, I don't want to say, um, the only person, or I don't know if he even was the first person, but he certainly put into practice and, and enunciated the concept that when that matter doesn't just disappear out into in, into nowhere, but is just transferred. It may be transferred into heat. It may be transferred into other chemicals and other molecules. It tra it's transferred from solid to 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 gas, whatever it is. And he got this concept, and he also came up with. So uh, he was an amazing character, actually. Uh, before he was um, guillotined in, in, in the French Revolution. So he was a bit of a privileged um, a, a person. But he, for example, um, almost described the concept of the element, and he described oxygen, and he described, you know, hydrogen. He didn't call it exactly, exactly uh, those things, but he actually identified that earth, wind, and fire, okay, it was, it's not just earth, wind, and fire, but it's actually there are elements involved. The mm. point is, because he understood this concept of matter being transformed, he was the one that brought up the concept that you needed oxygen to burn something. This is this is pretty much it. And when you burn something, carbon, um, you know, wood or anything like that, you then produce this 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 concept of carbon dioxide. And so it was this concept that he was he was actually thinking about. And then because when you burn something and then heat came off and energy came off. He then began to think, he never used the term calorie, okay? Mm. But he did begin to give the concept of heat being given off when stuff was happening, okay? Mm. Including, including he finally worked out and, and, and went to the situation that burning a piece of wood meant oxygen and giving off CO2. Mm -hmm. And he then equated that to when we ate, that the food was then being burnt, oxidized, burnt, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And CO2 given off. And he equated the two things together, that they were similar processes, which, which they are in many ways. And that is, in very many ways, the birth of the calorie, because he then realized that, well, wait a minute, if heat is given off when you burn a piece of wood, and if we eat a piece of meat or, or vegetables or what have you, um, that we must be giving off, that it must contain these calories, which he didn't name, these calories as well. And that was really the birth of the concept that mm. when we actually ate food and burnt it, it was like burning um it was like burning a piece of uh, of, of wood or burning a piece of fuel and that's what we say right so we now we say well how much food did we eat how much energy do you burn and mm. and we still use the term and that energy you burn term 
actually originally came from Antoine Lavoisier. That's that's fascinating. So so this this whole concept of transferring energy being applied to human beings like we're little furnaces for example mm. and that transfer energy not being i mean it has to go somewhere so um that that was introduced by antoine and then thereafter the science sort of progressed even further so he he didn't come up with a calorie i remember you saying that in the book as well where did the the the, the calorie itself where did that come from so actually where that then came from um from the Germans, the Germans, and, and it did come from the Germans, and German uh, agricultural, uh, uh, actually, because uh -huh. what then happened was it then quickly went into, okay, th there was a middle ground in which it involved some French people, <laughs> more French people, in which where was the calorie, uh, uh, where did the whole the concept of the calorie came from? And it, was, it became a measure of heat, okay? Mm -hmm. And so people began to understand and begin to nail down how much, uh, what a calorie actually um, actually meant, and as mm -hmm. you know, we now know that a, a calorie is a unit of energy that raises water, the temperature of water, a certain a, a certain amount. And so, when that then came um, to be, then people started thinking about well, how do we measure them. And then a then this is when we went back into it, it, in, in, into the French munitions manufacturer. Okay, of all the things in the world, and they came up with the concept of the bomb calorimeter. Yeah. Okay, where we can then, in effect, you you sort of, I mean, they were using it to measure the energy output of a bomb, like seriously, literally, but, and 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 they invented it. But then people then, and these were then the German farmers, agricultural industry begin to utilize it to measure how much energy there was in food, rather than in bombs in food. Mm -hmm. Why agriculture, in particular, domestic, uh, um, you know, cattle and what have you, because farmers really care. How much do they feed their animals? Therefore, how much milk and meat you actually get out the other side? And so they were the first people to really be concerned about exactly what they were feeding their animals mm. and therefore exactly what you output it. And they begin to use this bomb calorimeter to measure the total amount of energy of energy in food. So, so, so you went from the whole concept, this, this rather ephemeral, ethereal concept of heat being produced and then slowly working off the, off, into a way of measuring it and then finally moving back into food again because of agriculture. And now, yeah. because of agriculture, we now have this concept of calories being, uh, being the energy content of, of, of food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it sort of born out of com the, the commercial side of agriculture, right? So you're trying to transfer energy into your livestock so you can plump them up and you can figure in out as, how in much... as efficient a way as possible so for yes. every penny or pound whatever drachma whatever money it was at the time that, that was being put in you were trying to be as efficient it was a based out of need how can i be as efficient as possible what can i feed my animals you know to get the best meat and the best um, um uh, uh, milk for the least possible money that i can put it pretty much Gotcha. Okay. And w was was that the time where we figured out um, the differences between the energy in uh, the different macronutrients, so fats and carbs and protein? Or was that pre that was was that preceded? This so this was before because then what happened was we have to introduce uh, um, an, another person, and this was a guy. So now we are at just chronologically for those mm. of you who are, um, we're now probably in the late eighteen hundreds. Okay, so we're about 1880 or so. And 1880, uh, it was actually before that, 1870s, a guy named Wilbur Olin Atwater, okay, came, came, came to be. So he was a professor of chemistry um, at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And he um, was interested in the concept of the calorie. And so he visited, he visited um, one of these agricultural stations. They had these agricultural stations in, in Germany where they were doing the science. On a sabbatical, pretty much, okay? And so he went, and he, un he, he learned a couple of things. First of all, he understood the concept now of bomb calorimetry. He understood what they were trying to, what they were trying to do. But these were, these were the agricultural industry. He then went back to Connecticut and, um, and set up these agricultural stations as a concept in the United States. But his interest then was not what happened when the cow ate um, um, whatever it is you, you, you fed the cow, but hang on a second, if we could do that for animals, 
surely we should be thinking about doing that for humans. Mm -hmm. And so then at Water, between the years of 1880 and 1900, and I want everybody listening to this to consider this before you complain about your job again, <laughs> because what Atwater then did between 1880 and 18... So, so Atwater understood what I call the sweet corn phenomenon. Where, when you eat the sweet corn and you look, you look at the loo the next day, you clearly haven't absorbed all the sweet corn. We understand this phenomenon. He understood this phenomenon. And so he decided, well, you know, how much, how much of, the, of the energy are we absorbing? So he, in over 20 years, put lots of food into a bomb calorimeter to burn food and measure how much temperature came off. Lots of food, all kinds of food, mm -hmm. all the foods you can think of. But critically, he then fed these foods to human beings and then burnt their poop, all right? Like literally for 20 years, this is what he did. So now he understood how much energy went in the top end and how much energy went out the back end. And because he understood this, we now, we now appreciate, he now appreciated, pardon me, how much energy we absorbed, okay? And so based on that, he then came up with his famous at-water factors. And, and these at-water factors we still use today. And yeah. these are the nine calories for every gram of fat, four calories for every gram of carb, and four calories for every gram of protein. And he did this, in effect, over 20 years um, because of this burning and feeding and burning. Um, and he published it 1901, 1902. And so all of the calorie counts pretty much everywhere that we see are more than 120 years old based on Atwater's burning experiments. Wow. Okay. So with these burning experiments just just to <laughs> hold on to that that image for, yes. for just a second here so he would burn it in a in a controlled environment i i guess and collect the gases to estimate the energy is that is that what he would do no 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 so a bomb calorimeter is a sealed container mm. um where you put desiccate dried food ah. into or or poop <laughs> okay okay in, in into the container and why dried because water um to, at least to uh, a human being, does not have any calorie content. Now, mm. if we are a nuclear power reactor, <clears throat> if we are a nuclear power reactor, then water has, then we can break apart the, but we're not. Okay? So, so water has no calorie content to us. So if you dry off the water, just evaporate off the water, and you then have the dried food that is there, or poop, and then you put it into a sealed container that is pressurized with mm -hmm. pure oxygen. And the reason why you do that is so that everything burns. And then you... In effect, he puts a spark of electricity. This, by the way, is still the technology we use today. Yeah, it's yeah. just the machine just looks a bit better. And you spark and burn it. So, but around the sealed container, the sealed pressurized container, is a water jacket of known volume, X liters of water. And so you burn the food, and literally you have a thermometer in the water jacket, and you measure what the temperature is. And a calorie, a, a heat calorie, a small C calorie, is the amount of energy it takes to raise one milliliter of water, one degree Celsius at sea level. A food calorie, which is 1,000 little calories, is one kilocalorie, is the amount of energy it takes to raise one liter of water, one degree Celsius at sea level. And so that's how you measure it. You burn food, you have a known volume of water, you have a thermometer in, and you just measure what the temperature of the water raised, and that is how you calculate the total number of calories in a food. Right. Or poop. And, uh, or, or poop, yeah. And we'll, we'll put kilojoules to one side for now because i think i think you explained that really well in terms of the differences in, in the book but ju just to reiterate the point so these calorie measurements that were uh, calculated by atwater in a, in around 1900 1902 1903 have not changed in over 100 years and this is still how calorie counting books and calorie counting apps all, all work is that is that fair that, to say? Now, that's correct. Now, there is a little bit of wobble. So in other words, mm -hmm. now you're going to listen to this and you're going to go to your cupboard and, and begin to calculate. You'll yeah, yeah. find a little bit of wobble. And the wobble comes primarily from the way people calculate how much protein there is in a specific uh, uh, item of food. So because of that wobble, there's a little bit of other things, but there is a little bit of wobble, but pretty much it's based on 449, right? Four, Four four nine. Those four, at four, 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 calories. Nine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and protein is uh, slightly different because there's different energy uh, consumption to break down certain types of protein, right? Regardless of w regarding where it comes from. That happens later. So, 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 so the problem is what they actually have calculated. This is entirely based on the on on the burning experience, um, burning experiment. 
the wobble comes from the fact that so fat and if if I might just just to be boring slightly and nerdy for a second, fat and carbohydrates are are made exclusively of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Exclusively. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all in different configurations. The the thing about protein that will be relevant in the metabolism era, uh, element of it as well, but this is just a digestion element, um, is that it also contains nitrogen, and nitrogen is very un it needs to be dealt with. And and when we're actually dealing with protein, if we don't use it and we have to and we have to move protein and transfer it and be and make it become fats, for example, you need to get rid of the nitrogen. And so the nitrogen then comes out as we weed it out, all right, pretty much. Uh, and when it comes out, but but so dealing the way that most the way that everybody pretty much actually calculates how much protein there is in a food is by estimating how much nitrogen there is in a food and how much mm -hmm. it actually comes out the other side. So this is the complexity. But all proteins, that twenty amino acids that make proteins, do not contain the same amount of nitrogen. And this is part. This is part of the problem and the complexity of it, mm -hmm. which is why there's this wobble. So people never. You, you can empirically determine how much protein there is in a food, but that takes a lot of effort. So people estimate how much protein there is in a food. And so it's a little bit kumsi kumsa when, 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 you're, when you're there. When you're there. Okay. Fine. Mm. So, so we've, we've established the, the history of um, the, the concept of energy transfer, the uh, measurement of said energy transfer using calorie, how we measure the calories in food. Um, how the fact that these calculations have largely been unchanged for a long period of time. Where, uh, where, oh, before we go into the issues w with the calories themselves, why don't we talk a bit about how we expend said energy when it's when we consume it? So, uh, you mentioned three areas in in the book. You have your your basal metabolic rate, your obviously your physical activity, and your dietary thermogenesis. And I think then we can get into the conversation about the the nuanced discussion around energy transfer and why that doesn't necessarily hold true considering we eat food rather than a, a jumbled up mix of calories and various flavors so what we do with energy we do i mean you, you've already said it very well actually so energy so you've obviously we eat food and we have we burn the food and and we burn the food primarily for three in three different ways Okay, and this is it adds up to 100%, but obviously these things move. And the first and greatest amount is your basal metabolic rate. And this is what people generally in, in common vernacular we call your metabolism. My metabolism is fast, it's slow. And this takes around 70%, pretty much 70% of the energy that we actually consume is spent on this. And your basal metabolic rate is everything that keeps you alive. Your brain working, your heart beating, um, um, breathing, all of the things that we have to do, even if we're lying down and doing nothing, okay? And actually, it takes 70% of the, of, of the energy you eat to do that. The other 30%, you can in some way do something about, okay? So your, your basal metabolic rate, interestingly, the 70%, we have almost zero effect on. Okay, mm. Our body size and how much we exercise and how much muscle we have influences this. So we have we can do a little bit about it, but actually, uh, the rate is the rate that 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 it is. The other thirty percent, however, comes from two elements. It comes from physical activity, and this we all understand what it is. All right, the more you exercise, you you know you can change the amount that that you actually burn from there, and crucially, what we call diet induced thermogenesis. And thermogenesis means heat production, and when we eat, um, it takes. When we eat, it takes energy to, it takes dough to make dough, okay? And so it takes energy to make energy. And this energy is when we eat, your body then gets into, in, into a situation that we, it needs to metabolize the food. And that is diet-induced thermogenesis. And so that is heat that, act, that actually comes off as well. In terms of percentages, physical activity, we're probably talking around, of the 30% that's left, around 20%, okay, of mm -hmm. your energy. Roughly speaking, clearly that can shift if you're running the London Marathon, for example. Um, but then the other ten percent is probably diet-induced thermogenesis um, as well, and thermogenesis in general, actually. So, in other words, if you are um, non-shivering thermogenesis, which means that you're, you're obviously you're shivering, this is this is mm -hmm. still physical physical activity when you're doing. But then, if you are just producing heat to try and keep yourself warm, that's part of thermogenesis, heat generation as well. Um, so, diet and thermogenesis is about ten percent. 
this is a slight uh, uh, sidebar here, but mm. yeah, um, people who are jumping into cold baths uh, for varying amounts of time, are they activating uh, a certain area that is going to increase their uh, their calorie um, their, their calorie expense in their calorie consumption? The, this is the theory. I don't know how. Uh, I don't know if a single cold jump is going to do this. There is a there is a bit of our we call it brown fat, mm. okay, that in, in, in our body. It's not actually fat. So fat is energy storage. Um, brown fat is called brown because it's got so much mitochondria, which is our mm. energy, which is our energy supply uh, p- powerhouses in our, in our body. It produce, well, it produces energy, but in brown adipose tissue, brown fat, pardon me, same thing. But brown fat, it's not linked to producing um, um, energy for us, it's linked to just producing heat to actually keep mm. us warmer. And so the smaller mammals, mice and what have you, will have a, a larger percentage of brown fat compared to normal fat. Um, babies will have a larger percentage of brown fat compared to, to us who are in central heating and wear jumpers. But then if you, however, are, um, say, an Inuit in the past who actually live in an igloo you, you, you're out, out in the middle of nowhere, well, then they would have a lot more brown fat as well to keep them warm. So the whole concept of jumping into a cold, you, you, you know, icy, icy water is to try and upregulate your brown fat. You know, uh, there are other things as well, as far as I understand, but this is mm. part, of, part, part of it, to try and increase your energy um, expenditure. Yeah, yeah. I've really jumped in a cold bath a couple of times, um, and it's, it's invigorating. Uh, That's a good word you- for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good word. And you, you jump out and uh, you feel amazing for about 10, 15 minutes. But every time I've done it, mm. I get a cold like three days later. And I can't tell why. I don't know whether it's because like my stress response just goes through the roof. And then I, and then your immune I, system then plummets because of because the whole thing. Yeah. 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 I think it might be that from, from that like high degree of stress. And then I, I, I deplete my reserves for want of a better word. And then I, I get a cold a few days later. So for me, it's never really worked. And I, I just instead go for a run without my jumper every now and then and you know i mean creating a much as much heat anyway so uh yeah i don't know if you've ever jumped in a, in uh, a no pond yet. well i tried once it was so unpleasant um that <laughs> i said do you know what if the whole concept is to try and and increase i like you what i do is my, okay my favorite exercise is 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 cycling is mm. if it's my thing is if i start cycling and i'm already warm then i'm wearing too much clothes and so yeah. I always, and my wife thinks I'm crazy. But so when I start cycling, I go out where I'm okay. I'm not freezing cold. Clearly, I'm not. I'm not a masochist. But I need to be slightly chilly. Okay, it needs to be slightly un- at winter time, not in the summertime. It needs to be slightly uncomfortable almost when you start because by mm-hmm. the time you're in, say 15, 20 minutes in, and your and your engine is up and running, I'm fully comfortable. Yeah. And so then is a situation where I'm in a cold. I'm now producing heat, and so that is my 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 ethos. My wife thinks I'm mad. She goes on at a big jumper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually my uh, my fiance is the same she always looks at me when i'm about to do a run uh, outside and i'm just like i've just got a hat on a t-shirt shorts yeah. or whatever i'm just about to go running she's like you are crazy like yeah. what, what are you doing just what are you doing what are you doing yeah. it's too cold <laughs> I say you heat up pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, I really enjoy the story actually about you uh, uh, hill cycling uh, in your Lycra. You, I, I hadn't come across the was it mammal? Ma- mammal. M a m i l. Middle age men in Lycra. That's me. That 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 that's me. <laughs> Does Jane cycle as well? Not in Lycra. <laughs> <laughs> and she's got an e-bike. So when we go out to oh, yeah, gonna... listen, listen, domestic bliss is hard won. I just want to point point, point out to you. Yeah. And so, um, um, with, with with her with her e bike, me, you 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 know you know in this masochistic thing, yeah. we you know maintain domestic bliss. So I can work myself stupid, and she can have a have a good time, and and our marriage stays in bliss. That's fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. Um, I was, uh, I, was I, I actually I have to admit uh, there was a uh, part of the book where I remember getting the chemistry lesson from you and it just brought back loads of memories from I'm sorry about year, that. medical school. I know, I know, but I, I did feel uh, vindicated when you were talking in, about how you promptly forgot a lot of this stuff as soon as you left the examination hall. Cause that's like, that was literally like my experience as well. Like I would, I would revise so much. I learned all these different pathways. And an hour after the exam, it would just like just filter out of my sponge brain that couldn't hold on to the uh, 
the juicy liquid of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> what a waste of oh, what a waste of glucose. What a waste of ATP. But anyway, I know. That's... <laughs> I know. But the, the, uh, 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 it reminded me about how cells contain hundreds, if not thousands, of mitochondria, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. I I, I didn't actually grasp the magnitude of the mitochondrial density that you find in cells but that, i mean that that is the basis of of how we we break down uh, energy mm. or, or create energy right mm. that's correct that's mm. correct and and people think it's just one or two mitochondria no it's actually depending on what you're talking about particularly in your muscles we're actually talking mm. hundreds thousands of copies of, of of mitochondria yeah yeah and so uh, you mentioned uh, basal metabolic rate uh, mm. here being the the largest uh, way in which we expend calories so to, let's talk about that relationship to size because I think people, um, everyone's everyone's heard that term. I've got a slow metabolism, or you know, I'm, I'm big boned, or, or whatever. Um, but w- what is the relationship to size and and your metabolic, your basal metabolic rate in particular? So you're absolutely right. A lot of how many times have you heard it? Right? Oh no, I am larger because I have a slower metabolism, or, or, or what have you, or I'm smaller, so I have a higher metabolic rate. And this is just not true so the biggest the biggest determination of your basal metabolic rate is your size i mean specifically it's actually depending what part of your body you're talking about if you have more muscle you have a higher basal metabolic rate if you have the fat is less uh, metabolically active than muscle but your total body body weight so the larger you are the higher your metabolic rate the uh, analogy will be that while if you look at a mini mini okay like a old school mini cooper and it zips around and you think oh look at it it's it's it's, it's pinging around whereas if you look at a big suv it kind of it kind of moves about what what looks like slowly but at the end of the day the big suv will always use more um, um fuel than the small tiny car and mm-hmm. the same is true for 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 body sizes f- f- for us. So the bigger we are, the more fuel we use, even though we appear to be slow and lumbery. And but whereas the skinny, wiry person, you know, looks like you know really energetic, he'll always use less energy than than mm. than, than the larger person. Okay, so we we have this. Would you, would you say it's like a non non linear relationship to size, our basal metabolic rate? It is non-linear. So when and when we mean non-linear, we mean that if you are twice the weight of someone, you don't have a metabolic rate that's twice as fast as someone else. Hmm. And the, how you calculate that is actually relatively complex, and I go into it. But it's it's not linear. So 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 it's not. Is it geometric? I don't know. I forgot my maths. I, I don't know what what exactly it is. But it's Pro- not. It's related. It's definitely directly related. Mm-hmm. But it's not. Uh, uh, twice for for, for it's not for proportional to the size. So if it's you, not. Pro- if it, it's proportional. Big, it's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. proportional to the size, but it's not. It's not like twice the size, twice the twice the metabolic rate. Yeah, great. Okay, great. So we, we've established all these uh, facts about uh, calories, how we burn calories. Let's talk about um, a bit about why the calorie theory just doesn't hold up uh, today. So w- what are the other nuances within food itself that uh, will differentiate. Will will we'll, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Will we'll explain why the calorie count on the pack of food doesn't correspond to the energy that you consume or or or, or utilize in that way. Okay, so there are two stages to the way. Uh, there are two stages to us getting the calories from the food because we eat food, not calories. Um, the first is digestion and. We understand what digestion is. Mechanical digestion is where we chew and the washing machine sound that our stomach makes, peristalsis. Um, And then the long, huge chemical reaction, which is largely what digestion is, which then breaks down the macronutrients into sugars, fatty acids, and amino acids, which are the broken down portion of protein. Now, once this happens, it is absorbed into our blood. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's the digestion element. At water's burning experiment took into account how much of the sugar, fat, and protein we finally absorb into our blood. So he he, he got that done. The second part, however, is that because once we get sugar, fat, and carbs, sorry, sugar, fat, and protein, amino acids into our blood, that's not the end of the story. That is not our fuel. Sorry, that's not our energy. It continues to be fuel. So this sugar and fat is then transported to our organs that matter or cells that matter and are then metabolized into energy. Okay, so that 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 is the critic that's the crucial thing. And it's this stage that takes a lot of energy that Atwater didn't, couldn't 
take into account. Mm -hmm. um, and this differs whether or not we're talking about a protein, whether or not we're talking about fat, or whether or not we're talking about sugar uh, or, 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 or carbs. And so we know, for example, that a calorie of protein makes you feel fuller than a calorie of fat, than a calorie of carb mm. in that order. And a large part of that is because of the amount of energy it takes our body to metabolize um, to metabolize each of these individual uh, macronutrients. Mm -hmm. um, so one, so just to put some numbers on it, to put some, some flesh on the bones. So for every 100 calories of protein that you will eat and, and, and absorb, we, our body is only ever able to use 70 calories, seven zero. So 30% of the protein calories we eat is used to sort out protein. In large part because they have to get rid of the nitrogen. Okay, so this is this is part of the issue. This is why it yeah. takes so much energy. So, if you actually look at the calorie counts everywhere, the protein calories are thirty percent wrong. They're already out by by thirty percent before we even begin to discuss anything else. So that's the most um, extreme, I think, of the differences. How about carbs? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends if we're talking about the powdered white stuff which actually is very, very calorically available. Okay, it takes very little energy. 97% available. So for every 100 calories you eat, you need three calories to deal with the sugar. So 97%. Whereas if you have whole meal bread, you stuff with fiber in it, then it's about 10, it's, it takes 10% of energy. So for every 100 calories, you need 10 calories to deal with a slice of whole meal bread. Fat is very efficient and so atwater was correct with his calculations for fat fat is fat and it is nearly 100 percent available when you eat it it takes near it takes next to no energy to deal to deal with fat and so there we go those are and and those differences in numbers come from the metabolism because atwater has already taken care of it in the digestion element um, of mm -hmm. it so in total i would probably say the calorie counts on all the foods are probably out by about 10 15% depending how much protein and fiber there are actually in the food. Okay, fine. So but that's not the end of the story, is it? Because mm. otherwise your book would be called Why Calories Don't Count, parentheses, as much. So, so, so you, there's like the, the, the um, uh, net meta metabolizable energy yep. uh, calculation there is. But then also there's the actual food. So uh, when, I, when I was imagining a food when you were making that description, I thought of like... Um, uh, like a nut, so let's say an almond. Okay. An almond has got a lot of fat, it's got protein, it's got carbohydrate, it's got it's got the mixture, as most foods do in varying mm. proportions. So when we look at uh, the almond, how does that calorie um, adjustment make, uh, how, how do we make that calorie adjustment in an almond, con considering the different proportions of macronutrients? Oh, okay. So that is not an easy question to answer, and I think I think, in, <laughs> and I think in many ways, we need to do that for each food individually. And yeah. so, so it will, for now, still always be predictions because mm. it is because obviously we can obviously take up the almond apart and say what percentage fat, protein, carb is in there, and sort of work out what the calorie counts are. But that doesn't tell you how they interact together. And yeah. because how they interact together really, really influences. I'll, I'll give you a, a better example might actually be an orange. Okay. So where for if, if you, because you could obviously everyone knows what an orange is. And we know that when we squeeze an orange, we get orange juice. Okay. So it's exactly the same food, except when you squeeze the orange juice, you get this pulp that's left, which we think, well, we can't digest anyway. And we drink the orange, orange juice. The difference there is enormous, okay? It's exactly the same amount of calories we can absorb in the orange juice because it's mostly in the sugar and in the orange. But just by the fact of us eating the orange, a number of other things happen, which means that the total calorie, the, the, cal the sugar calories in, in, in the orange are dealt with completely differently. We, first of all, we're eating as opposed to just drinking the sugar. All right, mm -hmm. which is in orange juice, which incidentally has as much sugar as there is in Coca-Cola or, yeah. or any other soda. Okay, and and natural sugar is not better than Coca-Cola sugar. It just isn't. So just by the fact that you have a whole orange there that you're eating and you're dealing with the fiber and you're eating it and your digestion system has worked on it, the way that the sugar is released 
first of all takes a longer time rather than just 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 going in and spiking in your in in, in your blood um but then the presence of the fiber the way that our intestines work uh, um helping the microbiome as it as you know the bugs in our gut as it goes mm-hmm. down um helping us be regular so there's this whole you know other holistic elements of it of eating the food that comes into play beyond purely the calorie because if it's purely the calorie then drinking the orange juice and eating the orange will have exactly the same effect yeah and that's not the case you feel fuller with an orange you know and everything is going to be better worse with the orange juice i'm not okay before people in the orange juice community you know start start throwing stones at me I'm not saying orange juice is bad for you, okay? I'm just saying that there is a substantive difference, um, even though it's the same source food, between eating the orange and drinking the juice. So I think that is what we need to really take into account um, yeah. beyond counting the calories in each of the individual macronutrients. Yeah, yeah. So within the um, foods, there are inaccuracies in how we calculate the calories. Yep. Within uh, the same foods, there are different preparations that we can go into in a second as well that yep. will determine the amount of energy that we absorb. And then that's before we actually get into the individual differences of the person consuming said food as well. Correct. Their current weight, uh, their proportion of uh, visceral fat, um, their genetics, uh, something that I'm sure how, you can how speak active on. they are, you know, you know, all of all are. of the things, all of the things yeah. that you have to put in, um, yeah. yeah, and the state of the microbiota as well, yeah, um, which is a whole other field, and and I know I, I, I'm going to ask you to sort of postulate here because there's a lot of unknowns I think in terms of how we can assess people's microbiota and how that actually impacts um, the 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 extraction of energy from food as well. Um, but what, what, are we, what can we tell about um, someone's microbiota state today and how that impacts the energy uh, consumption from the same food? So, so the same bowl of cereal, can, can the energy consumption from that be different from person to person based on their microbiota differences? Oh, oh un- undoubtedly. So, so just, just to get some nomenclature, your microbiota is the population of bugs that live in our guts. And there are as many bugs that live in our guts as there are cells in our body. So 37 trillion um, um, in, 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 our, in our guts. I think um, many people would have heard about this. They heard about prebiotics and probiotics. Um, I'll give you my, my, my um, and people always ask me, you know, is, micro, is the microbiome, is it good science? Is it bad science? I think it's relatively new science. And I think that's part of it. Yeah. We're still understanding more about it every single day. But what is clear, crystal clear, is that we need a healthy microbiome to be healthy, okay? And and what does a healthy microbiome mean? In its most simple terms, okay, as varied as possible. So we want a whole different variety of, of, of bugs in our, in our gut because with variety comes a better ability to deal with food, right? Because obviously if you need certain types of bugs to help you digest or metabolize certain elements of the food, well, then the more the kinds of bugs that you have, then well, then the more different types of food you can actually you can actually deal with. The bugs play a role, a big role in our um, in our health, primarily actually in the immune system, because well, the bugs have to interact with our immune system, and it actually plays a big role big role in our our, our immune system. So that mm-hmm. that's what we definitely you know we need a healthy microbiome. We can debate whether or not by changing our microbiome we can make someone fat or skinny or, or smarter. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we need it to be healthy. And the key thing about getting it healthy is to feed it as much fiber, as much different types of fiber as possible. Eat a rainbow. You know, people say eat a rainbow um, 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 type of thing. And today's modern food environment, sadly, um, is lower in fiber than we should be eating by quite Mm. a bit. Um, And if you actually go to a higher income country, such as here in the UK, such as in the United States, we have now, we, not me personally, the, the field has now shown that our microbiome, on average, is far less varied than if you go to a country where they are eating far more fiber. And when they're mm. eating far more fiber, their microbiome are just more varied um, um, and healthier, in inverted commas. And that's where we are at the moment. We are in a moment where in the UK, we need to increase the variety of our um, microbiome uh, the, the the variety of the species of bugs in our microbiome, but we don't do, need to do this using expensive methods. We don't, okay, of mm. of of eating 
expensive pre probiotics. We just need to eat more fiber, maybe more ferments, okay, more, more, more things like sauerkraut and things as well. But the most critical element of it is fiber as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. And I love the way that you paint the picture in the in in your writing about the current state of the food environment as well. Um, I think the Marmot Review really brought that into a lot mm. of people's attention as well with regards to food security mm. and how difficult it is to navigate a landscape where you are um, bombarded with ultra high processed food. That's right. Um, that is, you know, a lot cheaper, uh, or p there's a perception of it being a lot cheaper as well uh, compared to whole foods, um, depending on, you know, your, your time constraints, the education uh, level that you have to actually prepare the food from scratch, all these different elements. But one thing that really did stand out to me is um, how ultra high press processed food creates less diet induced thermogenesis. Um, I, I, I don't think I, I'd fully appreciated that before. Um, is there, what's the particular reason as to why that might be the case? There are probably a whole lot of other complex reasons, I'm sure, as well. But it, a big part of that um, comes down... Okay, so just once again, let's just be clear. Processed foods are not mm -hmm. necessarily bad for you because cooking is a process. Fermentation is a process. So we eat processed foods. Most of our foods we eat are processed in some way. Ultra processed foods is processing of foods that we can't is industrial processing of foods that we can't do in our kitchen or or most restaurants. Okay, so 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 it's the stuff that are pretty much most of the prepackaged stuff that we buy is going to be ultra processed because it's industrially processed. Now the and I'm not an ultra processed food Nazi. Okay, I'm just I'm not. Let me tell you what the problem with ultra processed most ultra processed foods are the, because they're ultra processed. Prime, they are stripped of protein and or fiber, depending on what we're talking about, all right? Uh, depending on what we're talking about. It's just the way it is. Okay, the mm -hmm. processing just removes protein and removes fiber. Um, and it also removes flavor. So as a result, you have to add back in flavor, which comes from the holy trinity of sugar, salt, and fat. Mm -hmm. So ultra-processed foods tend to be lower in protein and fiber and therefore calorically very available, which means that our body uses very little energy to get the calories from ultra-processed foods compared to a steak, compared to celery, um, and typically higher in salt, sugar, and fat. And that is the reason why ultra-processed And we eat too much of it. In, in this yeah. country, UK, we get more than 50% of our calories from, of our energy from ultra-processed foods. So yeah. it does make a big difference. Um, when we're talking about ultra processed uh, foods, but primarily protein and fiber. That's yeah. lack thereof. That's why. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people like will will rag on the food industry, but um, you know, looking at it from a different perspective, they've been responsible for improving the food supply such that everyone has calories. They've made it super palatable. Uh, they've made it, uh, you know, verging on, I would say, addict. I mean, I, I can't keep junk food in my house because I will just continue to eat it. I mean, it's delicious, don't get me wrong. But like, you know, I have to make a concerted effort to make sure that I've got a good selection of other healthy foods in, likewise, in the house. Likewise, likewise. I don't, yeah. I, I, if you don't have, to my mind, if I don't have it in the house, then I won't exactly. eat it just without thinking. I mean, I don't mind having it outside and, and, and whatever you, but in the house, I try and keep it clear of, of, of that stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate definitely the the way you describe the um, uh, the the need for some processing. The way I describe it, whenever anyone asks me about processed food, is that you know all food exists on a spectrum. On one side, you have like raw food here, which ideally you don't want to be eating complete one hundred percent of your diet from. Some degree of processing is normal, even if it is steaming that tender stem mm. broccoli that makes it go that beautiful, vibrant green color. You're making a lot of the nutrients a lot more bioavailable. It's a lot more palatable, digestible. Toasting the spices, you know, to, 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 to oh, get out the flavor. That's a that. process. Yeah, you know, yeah, all, all, all that thing, a little bit of oil in. So these are all processes that make food part of the joy of, 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 of actually eating, not what we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and on that note, I'm definitely going to be uh, cooking some of your uh, recipes in the back of the book. The uh, is it the black the black beef brisket, the Chinese black beef brisket? That sounds incredible. <laughs> Lots of garlic. Mm. Lots of garlic. Yeah, yeah. Two hundred fifty grams of garlic. I have yes. to read that. Reread that. I couldn't believe it. Two hundred fifty grams. Try it and try it and report back. You won't taste the garlic. It'll just be so umami and rich. Okay. And delicious. Okay. Oh, well, I'm a, I'm a garlic fiend. I mean, I put garlic in everything. You know, I come from an Indian background. We shove garlic. Uh, the the holy trinity for us is garlic, chili, onion. 
And so everything is forms the basis for that. You know, all our curries, all the different, you know, uh, blends up and down the country. It's, it's amazing. For, for the Chinese, it's ginger, spring onion and garlic. Ah, there you go. <laughs> That's the holy there trinity there. Yeah. <laughs> so looking looking into the future, um, mm. for you, I mean, we always see you on our screens on, on BBC and obviously you've written a, a bunch of books now. What 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 are you most excited about um, uh, in, in, for the future, for your personal research, but also things that you might be writing about next? Um, from a personal research perspective, I mean, I study... Um, I study, I say I study obesity. I actually study body weight. Obesity just sits on one end of the spectrum. Um, but in particular, I study food intake. And I, I'm excited that over the next few years, two things, that we understand more about how humans control, how our human brains control our food intake and mm. everything about it, responding to stress or not, you know, um, um, being hungry or not. And this is, and, and not only me, by the way, the whole field is trying to is trying to understand. So that's the first bit, trying to understand more about how our simple human brains, you know, influence why I prefer eating an apple versus an orange or something along those lines. Um, but the second thing, which I think is very, very exciting, is due to the drive in genetic technologies that are that, that are now available and also more crucially in the computing power that therefore allows us to interpret this genetic data and how we interact with the environment i'm hoping that we get to a point so a lot of genetic testing companies that are out there at the moment claim to be able to take your genes and sequence them and, and what have you and make predictions mm. of what you can can or cannot do uh, i think many of them are overstating what they can what they can do but i think that in the near future 10 to 15 years from now we will get far better of being able to look at our genes and try and personalize some element of, of your diet, of your nutrition, mm -hmm. or of your illness um, um, go, going forward. So I think that, that to, 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 my, to my mind for my research is what we are really interested in. Within the what I want to do next from a broadcasting and nutrition and, and um, point of view, I still think that two things regardless of us sitting here and having this really civilized conversation and um, an enjoyable conversation about, about calories, this is, we are still a minority uh, um, in, 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 in where we are now. And I think mm -hmm. denying that is not going to help it. And so you need to continue speaking. I need to continue speaking. And we need to continue talking about the importance of food and of itself rather than anything else and the quality of food and eating, eating, eating food that is good for us and good for the soul. Mm. Um, we need to do this not by demonizing food, but by loving food. And I think and I think we need this. And then the other side of things, which I need to keep pushing, is to destigmatize obesity, uh, um, destigmatize de the larger in our society, and mm. continue talking about weight stigma and about the fact that because of biological processes, that for many people body weight is really not a choice. So that that's what I'm hoping to do um, go, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's definitely a, a, a noble mission. Um, you know, whether or not I succeed is another question <laughs> entirely, but that's that's the aim. No, I th I th I'm sure you will. I mean, like certainly from the work that you've done on the BBC and your book writing and all the all the talks that I've I've been to as well pre pandemic, you know, it, you're definitely getting the message out. And I think a lot more, particularly even on social media, I've seen a lot more acceptance of how it is. Uh, wrong to assume that someone has a choice in obesity and how there are so many other factors at play um, and you know on the podcast we, we try and educate people on just the magnitude of inputs that lead to someone being larger than another person mm. that are completely outside of their control as well and I think you know further work on genomics like you were just mentioning metabolomics how we can actually uh measure what's going on in our guts modulate that with dietary interventions as well as other lifestyle interventions for the betterment of health primarily and then weight control you know as a, as a side effect of really focusing on health um and moving away from having further and further accurate measures of energy transfer and actually more towards okay what do i love eating what is flavorful, what is culturally relevant, and how do we celebrate food as a means of communicating across the Love your countries. food. And I think if we <laughs> learn to love our food rather than fear our food, I think we go to a, 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 we'll go a long way into, into helping get ourselves better and healthier. Definitely, definitely. Giles, 
been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the chat uh, at the start as well uh, about American. Go football. 49ers. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure everyone else will agree, but <laughs> <laughs> that was great, man. That was awesome.